my introduction. Thank you. You just got the wonderful prompt that this recording is going to be, um, uh, this uh, event will be recorded. With that stated, if you do not wish to have your video on um, um, recorded, please um, turn your video off. I will at this time request everyone please to put their mics on off so that way we're not getting feedback. Wonderful. And again, so let me formally do again my introduction. My name is Maria Luisa Arroyo. I'm an advisory board member of New England Poetry Club, and I have the joy of, of hosting this um, guest feature here with three poets. Um, I'm hailing from Springfield, Massachusetts, you know, and as the arc of the program is, we will have three main guest poets. We will gladly and uh, gladly welcome any, any feedback in the chat to support lines that resonate with us. And then after the main, uh, after the main feature, a few questions, then we will transition to the open mic where we will have a maximum of 10 poets read. All right, and what I'll do is I will make sure to put the 10 poets names in the chat. Um, if there are spaces available, of course, we'll indicate that as well. So thank you so much. So we shall start with Denise Bergman. She is the author of five books, The Shape of the Keyhole, Three Hands None, A Woman in Pieces Cross the Sea, The Telling, and Seeing Annie Sullivan, all book length poems. She edited City River of Voices, an anthology of urban poetry. A stanza of one of her poems is permanently installed in a park in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I will be putting a link to her website here. So please welcome Denise Bergman. Thank you. And thank you, New England Poetry Club. And I'm just really excited to be reading with Cami and Kyle. I'll read from my new book, uh, um, The Shape of the Keyhole, and then I'll read some new poems after that. The book focuses on the life of a woman in 1650 in Cambridge, Massachusetts, who was falsely accused and then hanged for killing her friend's child. A week after her execution, she was proven innocent. The book spans the one week between the arrest and the execution. And I'm going to read some poems from each of the sections. The sections are the arrest, the so-called trial, the week, the days of waiting, and then the execution itself. The one in the constable's robe taps knuckles on her door. Fingers fisted white around bone, wrist the knocker hinge, taps his knuckles. She empties the wash bucket, walks round to the front, sees the back of the man, yes? Bucket clanks, rolls to a rock, stops. A lit fuse, his knuckle fist, no warning, the knock, not a warning, the knock, a command, a sentence. Read it forward in reverse, Subject, verb, ignite, verb, subject. The end starts here. Footnote. Indecipherable command, the knock. She doesn't know the end encoded in the beginning. Code breakers deep asleep, even awake, if ever awake, which key? The shape of the keyhole is the shape of the key. Autopsy, autopsia, see for oneself. Blue, the boy's lips, fingers, toes, ears, nose. The cold had stuck in the red gum, they said. The red gum come out upon him. Felled by ignorance, shrunken by pride, the examiners stopped looking for why, blamed her as their disguise. 
She had held tight her friend's shoulders before the baby's head crowned, lifted the placenta from the midwife's hands, suggested his name. Who is she? Who is she not that they will hoist her before, as she herself would say, double checking? Who, that no one saddles a horse, gallops to the dead boy's mother, asks. Fear awakens fear. Slipping on a crisp of ice, stepping on a fiddlehead, falling off the roof. Standing too tall, appearing too upright. Loving, letting loose, making mistakes unbeknownst to her, stumbling on the street. Fear of no fear, fear of a dozen fears, eggs in a pyramid, forgetting to cross your fingers, being visible, invisible, wrong place, too late, too early, on time. And the next um, poems are from the trial section. Outside the door, unsure, women pace circles, fresh washed bonnets, button up boots, palms on children's heads over children's mouths, shoving to hear the last word first, pacing circles, ovals, spirals, spiraling, shoving through their fear. Bobble heads high, jurymen proud to be picked know what they know they know decide decisive decisions. No need to listen. Listen to what? Nothing can be said. No one says the nothing. Butcher in the jury box twists to escape her eyes. Baker in the front row spits a gargled wad. Preacher shoots her with his trigger finger, pop with his tongue. Farmer steps out the door, signals his wife to horse up the wagon, go home, milk the cows. Constable boasts his call. Blacksmith's boy sneaks up and slaps her. Fear like smokehouse fire fills her loins. Now from the section where she's waiting. She begs notice, begs not to be noticed, keep away, step so close the fear in her breath mists your face, scintillates, hubbub, thrill, excitement, dizzy, spinning, chasing, tag, you're it, but you're not it, not her. She's too shocked to be shamed, too shamed to be in shock. She is concentric center and its widest ring, ripples cause and reverberation. The thrown stones plunk swallowed by silence. She is not the first centricity, first to be hanged, first innocence, not the last. Husband thinks, says to no one, I can stand with her, but he can't. His steps will trace back to him. He is losing thought. His voice has lost propulsion. He squints at her body. Shadow afar is substance. Substance close up is shadow. Who comes close stays away. Husband, tilling the winter hard ground, reconsiders walking towards her. She says, if you stand behind me, you're next in line. Surrounding moment is momentum, spiraling down a funnel spout, rushing to the river where a woman is stolen by current, to a well where a girl at the bottom apologizes for her worth, to the courthouse 
where one word ends a life. In momentum is moment. One link in a long chain is moments plucked, scrambled one at a time. Inside moment, momentum agitates to be unleashed. Now from the last section, the hanging. Faces beam, string her up eyes, drip snot noses, chapped grin lips, hang her high. Rope twisted seven times, knotted 12, length to spare. A tom squawks in the distance, hens defy the fence. A man who didn't come early took some minutes to wrangle his fowl. A girl whispers to her cousin, I know her. The minister hallelujahs, pounds his little book, thud, thud, leather to palm. A woman turns beet red as if choking. If I were there, would I be there? She straightens her skirt. Hill, sky framed in elm branches, 360 degree stage, a place. A hill, a view, a stage, spectators, actors. Whose eyes are on her? Who is aghast? For whom is this a party? She looks. If I were there, would I be there? If I were there, would I catch her eye? Tugged, pulled up the midday hill, handled, her bootlaces peck the grass. Afterward. Only a misses in the record of convictions. First name simply misses. The only no first name listed. In the column, found guilty, found guilty. In a hasty quote unquote trial. Two in the record, no recorded day or month, even the year, a question. So I hope that gave you a, a sense of the book. Um, I'm going to read three new poems. The first is called Map from Before the World Was Round. And this was indeed a map that I saw long ago, um, many years ago, at the New York Public Library. So it, it had a sense of authority to it. Map from Before the World Was Round. Gapped, ragged coastlines under tired glass. Measured, conquered, claimed, before earth became a ball cupped in a hand, before we could trek a straight line to return to where we began. Margins seethe spiraling dragon breath flame, spike tails, vehement wings, venomous tongues, hammer talon feet, scales, horned foreheads, saucer eyes, wide hinged jaws cut to the chase danger in and beyond the offing, beyond conception, beyond conceivable. Swimming, flying, creatures voraciously procreating, their hunger loud. This poem is called Found. After the bombings in Gaza, found. Baby doll, pink lower lip, dented dimple chin. Red checkered cotton sheet and polyester pillow. Toe, uncle's toe, aunt's earring, ear, 
thong of uncle's sandal. 50 coffee stained pages of Darwish. Metal ladle hungry for soup. Rose petal lipstick cap, magic wand. Baby bottle nipple caked with milk, breast milk pump. Economics 301, snapped paintbrush, the half with the brush, wet blue tip. Metal safe with car title, birth certificate, tire, tailpipe, and in a carved wood frame. Blue flower pot from Damascus, wedding ring, graduation announcement, spelling book, calculator, stethoscope, running bra, Trojans, folded cell phone, a whispered I, whispered you, first five notes of happy birthday, half a realization, whole understanding, quarter tank of cooking gas, tenth of a second, measuring spoons nested on a ring, metal crutch, lightweight wheelchair twisted as an olive tree, nightlight, alarm clock, face, cheek a cave, figure in her daydream, dream of a coral reef, half a carved serving tray, silver platters idle destiny, fish tank frame, locket, shoulder bag, leather with brass clasp, pocket watch ticking, toilet seat, a sink's cold faucet, radio choked on words, TV antenna. The last poem is called Radio Garden, which is a website where you can tune into radio stations around the world. Tiny emeralds dot the borderless world, each a radio signal, immediate connection, no where too far. Amman, Derry, Ramallah, Lisbon, Buenos Aires, Dallas, Nome, up to the minute news, say so, song. Reykjavik, Mumbai, hillside village, desert town, Green flickers from the tallest tower on a hill, in a field, offshore, on a roof. New York, Arl, Gulu, AM, FM, screaming the pain, impounding the cry where true boundaries splinter, cross, merge, overlap. Here, barbed wire stitches dissolve. I know geography. Waste no time finding Nairobi, Xi'an, Gander's green pinholes on the tight knit map. Long after he died, I discovered a folded photo in my uncle's red plaid hunting jacket pocket. I am four at the kitchen table, earmuffed in oversized headphones, concentrating, reaching into short wave static for the imagined place where a real voice will arch its arrow purposefully into the air. My uncle tuning the dials and me nodding yes or no until the point lands. Thank you. Thank you, New England Poetry Club. So yeah, yes, so um, Denise Burr, may we please briefly unmute to give her a round of applause. <laughs> He deserves to hear our applause after every, and every poet deserves to hear as well. Because we understand that this medium is quite awkward in the sense that, you know, we don't be, we are not able to read each other's faces and expressions and so forth. And yet at the same time, we do marvel at this medium because we can reach around the world. <laughs> so thank you so much, uh, Denise Bergman, for that, that evocative reading. You know, I want to again invite, for those of you who may have come um, late onto the call, my name is Maria Luisa Arroyo. I'm an advisory board member of the Poetry Club. I facilitate, have the joy of facilitating the reading of our guest poets for the first three. We're also having an open mic uh, with 10 poets. Mm -hmm. Thus far, we have four um, poets. So we invite you uh, to put your name in the chat if you wish to read. Um, as was indicated before by Hillary, 
uh, we would like to uh, we like to strive toward a gender gendered balance. So we had thus far um, four men. Um, if others want to join on, please do so. So next up, we have Kyle Potvin. Kyle Potvin's debut full-length poetry collection is Lucin, Hobble Bush Books 2021. Her chapbook sound travels on water, won New England Poetry Club's Jean Pedrick Chapbook Award. Her poems have appeared in Bellevue Literary Review, Tar River Poetry, Rattle, Eagle Tone, and the New York Times. Kyle lives in New Hampshire. Lucent is available at the website that I will indicate here. Please welcome Kyle Potvin. Hi everybody, thank you so much. Maria Luisa, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, and um, Denise, amazing work. I mean, that story is so powerful and um, I look forward to, to reading more of that. Um, today, I am going to be reading from my, um, my new collection, which is called Lucin um, by Hobblebush Books. Catching the Green. Nothing like hitting the lights just right as you cruise down Second Avenue, in and out of cars with the precision of a cabbie, green after green after green past your old apartment, past the bar where you worked after work, past the Irish pub where you kissed the boy <laughs> belonging to someone else, past the dive where you celebrated your birthday all night long. Then you were snagged at the red light at 10th Street, stuck at the corner where your friend's place is now stripped bare, stuck where he downed vodka till dawn, stuck in the trembling smoke of his cigarette, Stuck where you saw the last of him, minutes hanging there until you look away in time to catch the green. One of the themes running through Lucin is about illness um, and it covers some of my experiences with breast cancer as well as those of, of friends uh, and family as well. So I'm gonna read a few of the um, um, my cancer poems today. Rogue Wave. Last week we stood on opposite coasts. On the Florida side, waves ran at my feet, snatching bits of sand from underneath. Persistent is the land grabbing cells inside me. I wondered how long I could stand before, unbalanced, I'd float away buoyant and hollow, empty as a jellyfish. And you, a continent away. I imagine your last thoughts, chicken for dinner, this awful cold. Before trying to save your dog, you were swept away by the rough Pacific. Back home, I stand, sand still draining through my hourglass toes. And I wonder, Molly, was it a relief to be taken without notice? This next um, poem is a sonnet. It's called The Hard Work of Dying. The hospice nurse explained the letting go. Give her space to do the work of dying. On the sill, a green heirloom tomato brought in before the frost, sat there, sighing. Or was that me not knowing what to say? Don't ask her things, such grief in giving up exchanges. Back off engagement, that way we help her go. Tea grows cold in my cup. 10 days since Emma took a sip of tea or ate a slice of grape. She sleeps while rain whispers a soothing chatter. The oak tree clears its throat, weeping acorns in the drain. Yellow snapdragons brighten up the room. A day from now, they'll see a second bloom. When I was going through treatment, I found that writing and reading poetry was really um, it, it, was a, it was really cathartic for me. 
Um, and one of the poets that I especially um, loved was Jane Kenyon. Um, so the Jane in this poem is actually, is Jane Kenyon, um, as well as some, some friends. Waiting for results. I am Jane, I am Ellen, I am Julia, I am smoke in the throat, blowing simple rings, rising, rising, rising. There she goes, then her and her. I said I would remember them, but will I? What if the breast is guilty again or the toe with its dirty cells? So let's change the topic, <laughs> um, go for a little something lighter. So let's, um, let's do a food poem. This is called Ramps and they are those scallions that you get in the springtime. Ramps and the epigraph, poached eggs on toast with ramps, bon appetit. Hail young allium, spring onion, wild leek. Your season is brief. Yet you are complicated, three parts in one, pungent bulb that hides beneath the surface, magenta stem, broad tender leaf that disappears by summer. Your ancestors have lined rivers and fed tribes. A city, Chicago, is named in your honor. Some try to preserve you, pickle you for the months ahead, but I say, sizzle in the heat of the pan, soften to unexpected sweetness, join the delicate egg poached on a thick slice of toast, thinly spread with cheese, fresh goat, ricotta, burrata. This Sunday morning, rock the maldon, run with the abandon of broken yolk. When I grew up, my brother was a, a year and a half older than me. And so when we were really little, we would tend to get into kind of a lot of trouble. I don't think it was big trouble, but it was definitely annoying trouble. And as a mom of two now, I, I, I get what that is like for my, or was like for my mom. Um, so our punishment was that we had to go to the naughty chair, um, which was a chair like um, in, in the corner of the room and we'd sit there. So kind of like timeout is now, of course it would be, um, uh, we'd be in different rooms. And the only way you could get up is if you apologize. My brother would like in two seconds, he'd be up, but I'd be sitting there, you know, I felt like for hours, probably like five minutes. Um, so I kind of see this as my Ars Poetica because um, I think it was all that time in the naughty chair that helped me become a poet, all this thinking. Lesson from the naughty chair. Stay there until you're sorry, and you were never sorry. So you sat with your deeds in the corner, crushing the velvet one way and the next, never examining your naughty, nail etching lines in the forgiving fabric, blue as heaven, blue as sea, blue as the rug beckoning, legs dangling long minutes above the blue, don't touch the floor until you think about what you have done. What have you done? You think, this chair is pretty. You are sorry now. And I'd like to end with one last poem. It's an unrhymed uh, sonnet which some may say isn't a sonnet at all then, but we can save that discussion for another day. Um, but many thanks to everybody at New England Poetry Club for inviting me today. And such a pleasure to hear Denise speak, um, early, read earlier, and Cami, really looking forward to you as well. Thank you all for being here. God looks down at 3 a.m. Good, you are awake. Your eyes blink like stars. Millions of eyes lit, unlit, open, close, brooding and bright-eyed in your lonely beds. Dark sky of worry up and down the streets. Concerns at this house, children, money, love. At the house next door, 
cancer, money, war, war, death, koalas, divorce, war, taxes, starry, starry night. My flock, please listen. Fret well, gnash your teeth, chew your inner cheek. This world is pain, do I have to say it? Who created it? Think hard about that. You lie, false corpses, arms full and soldiers. I see you are tired, me too, exhausted. The sky is fire, I will try again. Thank you. So I invite everyone to unmute your mics and to give um, Kyle Popkin a warm round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, and before I introduce our Academy uh, Thomas, I would like to note that we're pleased that we have nine readers for the open mic after Cammy Thomas reads. Uh, so we have space for one more. Um, I'd like to now I have the joy of introducing Cammie Thomas. So Cammie Thomas's first book, Cathedral of Wish, received the Norma Farber First Book Award from the Poetry Society of America. A fellowship from the Ragdale Foundation helped her complete her second book, Inscriptions. Her third collection, Tremors, has just come out and is available at Four Way Books. I shall put that link in the chat. Please welcome Cami Thomas. Thank you very much, Maria. And um, thanks to the New England Poetry Club, uh, Wendy, Hillary, Mary for putting this together. And um, a pleasure to read with my fellow poets. Um, and a special thanks to everybody who's here today from all over the place. It's very odd having a new book come out and all on Zoom. There's no geography and it's strange. There are no rooms, there are no towns. We're all just kind of here. But thank you very much for being here from all over. Um, I'm gonna read from Tremors. This is the cover. It's kind of a broken down dock. And I don't know, I love the image. It's in three sections, not the dock, the book. Um, childhood, middle life, and later life. And today I'm going to read from the later life section. Uh, and I'm going to kind of pair the poems. I'm going to begin with a couple of poems about memory. Three White Horses. I forgot where we were meeting tonight. Actually, I forgot we were meeting at all until you called. I forgot your mother had died or I knew someone's mother had. Had you told me her story? Was she the one whose older sister was a suicide? Did she beat you or am I thinking of someone else? Coming to your house again, I feel I've never been here. How could I misplace that bright green wall, this windy road, the field with three white horses. Half the world. I know where I am, but not all the roads I took to get here. Right now, Provincetown, watery sky just getting light, shapes in the room returning. I've been up for hours. Two trees across the street sway in a strong wind, pushed together, then apart, branches wavering, branches waving, like people talking, heads together, then not, cropped in, cropped out. I remember to visit friends for dinner, forget to bring the dish I promised, forget to apologize. I remember to take my pills, but not what they're called, the names cropped out. I think of my friend, which of her cats died last year, Agnes or Phoebe? I knew those cats. Half the world's gone missing. 
I write the names of my pills, put the paper in my wallet. Now a couple about lessons, uh, one that I'm trying to learn and then one that maybe it would be good for people to learn when talking to, to older people. Ladder, six rungs above the ground, night in heavy rain, eager to pull a clot of leaves from a blocked downspout, sopped, blinded, on my 68th birthday in my old nightgown, slick aluminum ladder, climbing to the downspout, midair and drench, my feet slipped off, I went flying, caught myself, gasped, slammed flat against the flexing rungs, gutter cascading, spout still blocked, backed down, took the shining ladder back to the garage. This next one is for my friend D. And uh, the title is a quote from a cowboy from when I worked on a roundup when I was 19. Watch out for the old cows. That's what the ranch foreman said. When they get old, they get mean. When you herd old cows, you're supposed to keep your horse away from their heads, not push them hard. Herefords have curved, sharp horns that can unseam you from groin to heart. Watch out for the old cows. Don't interrupt me when I'm eating. Don't tell me how to do things I've done for decades, like drive or think or cook a stew. My husband keeps a careful distance in case the horns take a wide sweep as I'm shaking off the latest invasion in my space by some political crime, some machine that breaks when I touch it, some unforgivable memory lapse I have to claim. Everything hurts, but I try to ignore it. My left psoas muscle, what even is that? while we're on the subject of the body, it starts to kind of make you notice it as you get older. So here are a couple of poems about that. This first one has a repeated line. I think you'll hear it so by way of sort of a chorus. It only repeats once. Dear heart, for decades I vibrated to your flutter, your arrhythmic timpani. Every day I worry, wishing will not make us well. My Greek cardiologist quotes Homer, commands me to live without fear, then implants a monitor in my breast. I can't see it, but I can feel it. Wishing will not make us well. A short metal warning under the skin, clocking your syncopated beats. My friend's husband, fit in body and mind, died at 60 of a massive heart attack. Wait, he said to her. Asymmetries. I have to return to the clinic for more imaging. They found some asymmetries. Nothing is symmetrical in nature, no two things alike, but these asymmetries might be fatal in nature, but unnatural, like the huge white pines at the end of my driveway planted together. One grew stocky and healthy while the other got tall, started to die, broke in half. One bird lifts its head higher in the nest, grows faster, tips into flight sooner, if the others even live. I'm driving on a highway and forget where I'm going, as if there's a branch in my brain that's split off, a gap that opened up. I guess the next pair of poems you might say is about the inescapability of desire. 
So this poem is uh, after 40 years of teaching and it's called Off the Job. Just wanted to say, I don't boss anymore. Keeping kids safe is so yesterday. No more birds forbidden to fly or fences containing whatever, goodbye. My stop that voice is out of gas, done crushing, done buckling up. Now I'll be the wild. Blame my bad behavior on the lion's breath, hot growl in the grass, my sizzling ass. Probably most of you know, Jones Beach is a huge, pretty wild ocean beach on this, on Long Island where I grew up. So this poem is called Jones Beach, Summer 2016. Just dip your toe in and the ocean grabs your heel and your hull, staves your keel. It finds your fingers, fastens to your flesh, fans out as when you lusted after that boy or ran away for a day at 10, or smoked cigars like a man. The things you have done that you ought not to have done. Stealing from a locker, sex play with your sister on the sprung sofa in Oyster Bay. Seaweed drags at your waist, wants you to stop all this forever. Do nothing but drift, because to yearn is to move, and to move is to inflict. When the tips of your toes touch the sand below, it billows into spires of hottest desires. Blew your first marriage. You swerved towards someone else, had to have him, even as you knew it would all soon cool. Look, that wild green sea of life and too much life that you have to turn and turn and turn from. And the final two are about what the title of the book is, which is Tremors. And I'm gonna begin by reading that poem. It came from a class I took with Gabriella Calvacaresi. So this is for her and um, the poem is in fragments, but I think you'll be able to figure it out anyway, sort of. Tremors. Provincetown Harbor is on the other side of the houses past the tall linden on Pearl Street. <laughs> of vibrating leaves. Next to a purple house, a small girl with a pinwheel is crying. When the wind comes, the boat boats all face right. Which way is east? Sometimes I don't care whether things matter to anyone but me. The pink roses don't care either. They grow for someone else's pleasure, but they don't know it. The girl's mother is so mad. Stop running in the street. She grabs her roughly, too roughly. Weedy oyster shell driveway, partial view of the unreachable bay, dark pink hollyhocks, tremor in my hand makes writing hard <sighs> in the leaves. The father untangles the girl from her red faced mother, leads her down the street, still carrying her pinwheel, a pile of clamshells in the driveway. I'm drowning, the mother has vanished. We can never walk back the spent. Peonies keep their green, but their faces are spikes now. And I'll end with a poem that's about an encounter with a bird. In the fourth month of the pandemic, up comes the huge tufted head cocked to the side. She seems to stare at me from the top of the pine tree, 
round yellow eyes with thick brows, broad honey colored chest, eases out a wing, ducks her head under, rhythmically cleaning. I wanna stay until dusk, watch her lethal silent descent on prey in the field next door. Everything must still look okay through her eyes. Small me far below, pulling up my mask in the carless street. Thank you all very, very much. Yeah. Thank you. May we invite everyone to unmute to give Cami Thomas a round of applause. This is a thrill. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yes, and also too, let's give all, all three of our featured poets, Denise Bergman, um, Kyle Potvin, Amy Thomas, a, a joyful round of applause. Yeah. Woo! Bravo. Uh, to quote my poetry mentor, one of many, Laurent Bolsonaro, uh, she's, she claims that I will agree that poetry is my church. <laughs> And you know, the three of you just definitely modeled that. And if we'd like to invite a brief comments as well, but if I may, and Je Denise Bergman, oh my gosh, I, you know, the intentional evocative listing, you know, the complicity of women, you know, in terms of being a part of the fear, being infected by fear, you know, I just, and then that evocative, evocative haunting line, if I was there, I would be, um, would I be there? You know, and also in terms of your reading, I was just marveled by your, your breathing pauses because they invited me to imagine the poems on the page. Oh, wow. There, it just, and then also too, in the other, in, before the world was round, you know, I was, you know, you were listing what I wrote down here, listing for vestiges of humanity destroyed. Wow. So, and that's what you, but that the wow is in honor of you, Dennis, Denise, because I'm responding to what I'm listening to. You know, thank you for, the, again, the gift of your poems. And thank you very much. <laughs> and then to Kyle, oh my gosh, it just, you know, for me, the, what it came up for me is, you know, I'm a, for those of you who don't know me, my, my degrees are in German language and literature. And, uh, you know, the same, I will say to Kyle, in terms of the Verdichtung, you know, verdichtung, um, the verb, the verb or the noun verdichtung, it, well, verdichtung means to compress, to compress into poetry, you know? And for me, it's it like, for me, it's like, this is compression. What I, what I wrote here is you rendered pain, grief, loss, trauma, you know, and you compressed it, that, that emotional incoherence into coherence you know, by having the sonnets, by having these forms and making, making them, again, what you model for me is that the only way through is through. So even as you intentionally shifted from very truly heavy poems, we needed to have that. And then you went to the levity. But again, that is part of our human experience, human condition. And I celebrate that in you as well, Kyle. Thank you so much for your insights and your careful listening. I appreciate it so much. <laughs> And Cami, oh my gosh, the subject of the body, you know, and I love the phrase in terms of, you know, you got a lot of, in all your instances in terms of alliteration and assonance, and then how the message of the symmetries go, uh, it can also feed into all your poems. The symmetry, for example, nothing is symmetrical in nature, you know, nothing is symmetrical in our bodies, nothing is, you know, symmetrical in terms of, as particularly as you were my, mindful of telling us, hello. I wrote down here, we as women of a certain age, we are reminded through your poetry that we are all still human, that women at every stage are human. And then in terms of the listing of the, of the intentional listing, again, marvelous, because these are the sort of brushstrokes, you know, in the air that I deeply value. And also in terms of like the dear heart poem, hello, it's like we, we this, this internalized reflection that we, with which we can all connect. So thank you so much for all for that. So that's what's one of my joys, again, in terms of, of, of hosting this, is to actively listen to each of the featured poets. Thank um, you, Maria. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. And now we will transition to the open mic. And what I'm going to do, so give me a brief moment. I'm going to type your names in the chat. And so that you know, and we have one spot less, uh, uh, one spot left. And with that stated, um, what I did is I, I well, you'll see. <laughs> 
I'll put the names in the chat and then I'll, I'll introduce you each. All right, so hold, thank you for your patience. Let me put this here. Oh, I should put it all on a list so that you know. Oh, oh no, actually. Not. Okay. One, two, three, four. I believe I have all their names. And then please, uh, yeah, so Ralph Culver, Beth Whitaker, David Miller, and please can correct me if I mispronounce your name, Lee Varen, uh, Chris O'Carroll, Ellie Bates, Steve Honig, Tina Hacker, and Mary, uh, is that Knuff? Knuff? I don't know, but please, you're on mute. So what, but when, when we, I announced you, then please correct my, my pronunciation of your name. I can't hear you because you're on mute. Maria, yes. we, ha we had one other person um, that was Paul Smith. Absolutely. Let's add Paul Smith. So may I invite Paul Smith to go first? And, one, and what I'll do, Paul, um, just for all poets, uh, keep it to one poem, please. All right. Thank you. So I will add also, Paul, may I invite you to go first? Thank you. Thank you, Hillary. Is he on? Can you hear me now? Yes, now we now we can. Now I hear you. All right. I think a good way for me to start is to say hello to my good friend Stephen Honig, uh, who's who steered me through all this. <clears throat> my uh, piece for today would be called an American appraisal. Uh, do you know, did you ever know, then why did you forget? As Americans, we think we are the richest and the best country in the world, sure. As individuals, we live with a myth that says we have plenty and then some. But to keep up this myth, we live a very negative lifestyle thus. We don't educate our children past the ABCDs. We assume they'll learn by watching TV. We have no universal health care. We teach our elders to knock on wood and then buy insurance. By the way, that four digit figure you see there, that's your deductible. We don't have laws about gun control. About gun control. If only we had invented the AK-7. So now we are allowed to kill as many deer as we can. And if there's none around, there's always mobs of people to aim at, but quietly. We do have common sense though. And what's the opposite of common sense? Rich sense, wealthy sense, or nonsense? Like anybody's burger with fries, of course. We hate and fear with a passion a condition known as aging and death. You wonder why God wants old people mostly. What does he know that we don't? As I was saying before the sirens went off, win at all costs, never fail. An all win mentality, in or out, the rewards will be fantastic. The punishments may be painful and dismal, jail without bail. So let us do battle, first by remembering, never start a sentence with so. And secondly, recognize our enemies, you know, ambition and pretent pretentiousness. Both come dressed in black. Half of us have this want, the need to be the best, or better yet, to have the most of everything. 
Some say, let's have it all, there's no going back. This while the other half cheers. Take it, grab it, it's meant to be ours. Just pile it up in heaps right up to our ears. And so the people can say, what a great place this is, let's stay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. And that was Paul Smith. Next on the mic will be Ralph Culver. Oh, thank you, Maria. Can everybody hear me okay? Good. Um, I have a brand new book out from Mad Hat Press. It's called A Passable Man. And uh, I'm going to read a poem from it um, that I hope is uh, appropriate for the New England Poetry Club. Um, there are a lot of the poem, many of the poems in the book are flavored by New England, but uh, this, this poem couldn't have taken place anywhere else. Um, it's called A Go at the Lifting Stone. And um, I'll dedicate this to Ellen. It has an epigraph from Fred Pitkin's History of Marshfield, Vermont, which was published in 1947. For many years, a nearly round granite stone about two feet in diameter sat at the easterly corner of the front steps of the store, whoops, now owned by Frank E. Brown. Few men in the town could lift it off the ground. I don't know if you heard my meditation bell or not there. A go at the lifting stone. The hands, arms, shoulders, and back consult briefly. A new challenge of some dimension, of serious intent. Promise heaves in the brain. This is our provincial glory. The bet down, budget, and you won't have to buy your own beer for a week. You think, in a sense, your future lies bearing its secret under the stone, the days breaking in your favor or not, an equation of space, its possibilities, conjuncting with the flesh and its limitations, all born up forever on the skin of the earth, a place that seems suddenly new and somehow getting younger by the minute until you have the confirmation you seek. By God, you are about to learn something, this being your sole duty. And you learn something, sure enough. Next day, when the usual warriors clap you on the armored brace, your lips roll back like a dog's, the bloody thing having not given an inch. The sudden multitude of flea-like urgencies in your ankle, you would rather die than bend to attend to. Closing your eyes to this and the uncompromising grins stretched across the faces of these yahoos buying you beer after beer after beer. Thank you. Thank you, Ralph. Next on the mic, we have Beth Whitaker. Hi, good afternoon. Um, this is the first time for me at this meeting. So, um, I can't believe I, I volunteered to read, but uh, please bear with me. Um, the title of this poem is Unfamiliar Face. A different man was driving the tractor, but I saw your face, his, yours, his, yours. Finally, deep in breathing acceptance, I understood it couldn't possibly be you. I sink into a resignation long ago imposed after watching the solid, life-filled airplane flying toward Tower 2 that morning, how insistently my mind tried again and again to see it stop before disappearing into a monstrous exhale of glass, but it never did stop. You will not be driving the tractor again. You have a young face in the many photos shared at the celebration of your life. Your beloved high school from 60 years ago mailed a note of condolence with a copy of the page from your senior yearbook, revealing a smile of an ambitious young man I have never met. 
but it's your face reflected behind me and beside me in the windows of restaurants and shops on streets we ambled together. I see your face at the wheel of a white car turning away from me at the intersection. Your face squints in the shadow of a deep blue cap's stiff brim at the golf range, chin thrust forward into the sun after a long arrow straight shot. I don't see your face in your ashes, gray and dry and seeming much too heavy for the flesh, blood and bones of your small frame. You're not reflected in the eyes of your cherished dog, 11 years enjoying your care and now my unconditional love alone. And I wonder, does she know you will never return? The bathroom mirror shows only my face, sallow, deeply creased and shadowed without your scruffy, soft face to distract. This uninvited and now unfamiliar face appears aged and empty of the thing that once produced the creases of laughter between mouth and cheek. I look into the stranger's eyes as they fill with tears and my heart lunges to hold and comfort her. She receives my compassion, bows her head to cry freely, and when she lifts her face to the light, we sense that eventually all will be well. And that's it. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Beth Whitaker. Thank you. Next on the open mic, it's David Miller, and I apologize for the typo in the chat. It is M I L L E R. <laughs> Welcome, David. Thank you, Maria. I, I know who you meant, so <laughs> <laughs> I was good with it. Um, hi to everybody this afternoon. Thanks so much to our three uh, featured readers and all my open mic mates. Um, this uh, poem is titled Talk Normal. Hey, this punk talks better than me. In fifth grade, I once again let fly some useful non-monosyllables like contradiction, unavailable. My sneering interlocutor, one more of the big kids, lunk on harassment patrol versus me, the spectacle twerp with an operable vocabulary. The identical person who decades afterward terse as ever, greeted his wife with a mumbled, I'm not feeling overly communicative as he sailed out on his gurney after an urgent cholecystectomy. Mm. Try it yourself. Hold these in your mouth. Schadenfreude, zero escape. Wrap your lips around prepubescent dendrochronology, give tongue to Lilliputian lapis lazuli, hypothalamus. Mm. It's goddamn delicious, bub. Got a problem with that? <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, David Miller. Next we have on the open mic, Lee Varon. Thank you, Maria and New England Poetry Club. This is from a book called The Addict's Mother. It's called, I Meet My Love in a Soup Kitchen. Throngs stream through the church door. I offer apples, bananas, above the roar of another Tuesday. And how are you? Always the question hangs among pushing hands, bleeding cries. You work with homeless addicts, but can you fix my son? as you sit and stir your coffee, dispensing hope with dinner. A madrigal of voices in the desperate air rises, falls, rises. Brief moments on the rim of sanity tilt my heart toward you, toward corridors of hope, where everything in the room is rinsed of dust, is shining. The wild moon still pushes against blackened screens, Another overdose in the bathroom, a constant winter, and still the language of love seeps in, settles into the crevice of night where I meet my love. Thank you. Thank you. 
Next on the open mic is Chris O'Carroll. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, this is Postcard from the Afterlife. <clears throat> How cool is heaven? Where do I begin here? The nightlife's hipper than pre-war Berlin here, yet wholesome as a cozy country in here. I'm suave as Cary Grant or Errol Flynn here. I've got broad shoulders and a dazzling grin here, plus perfect hair, flat abs, and strong cleft chin here. We all look like some sexy film star's twin here. Nobody hates the color of your skin here. Yang enjoys perfect harmony with yin here. The food is rich, yet all of us stay thin here. Nobody has to lose for me to win here. We're all on friendly terms with all our kin here. No politicians practice crooked spin here. I never get hung over from the gin here. None of my favorite vices is a sin here. Damned if I can tell how I got in here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. <laughs> so please welcome to the open mic, Ellie Bates. Thank you, uh, Maria. Thank you, New England Poetry Club and featured poets. Um, December 10th um, was the 191st birthday of a poet I have admired, uh, Emily Dickinson. And um, a few years ago um, in a, a chapbook that was published here on Martha's Vineyard, um, I wrote a palinode to hope. Hope is not the thing with feathers. If it were, it would fly away. Hope stays with you to comfort you, finding a place in your heart, not perched in the soul. Hope is a radiant sunrise, a light spreading over you, even in the chillest land, wrapping you in warmth, like the song of little bird in the gale heard. Hope is not the thing with feathers. It is a rudder on the strangest sea. It steadies your soul in sorrowful times, steers you on the right course where endings and beginnings meet. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Next on the mic is Stephen Honig. Thanks, Maria. Uh, so there's not a lot of poetry on the front page of the uh, New York Times, so forgive me if there's not much poetry here. Uh, I figured after reading the front page or one day last week, I'd give it a shot. And this is called American Litanies. <clears throat> Excuse me. They came looking for us, unaware of Eric the Red, DeSoto and DeGama, Raleigh and Hudson, Drake and DeLeon, Magellan and Verrazano, Champlain, Cabrillo, Cartier, Cabot and Coronado, clueless Columbus, his statues now defaced with red paint, broken noses on the ground, seeking those who trudge the land bridge, looking for a home. Now they speak French in the South, Inuit in the North, Spanish, Chinese, Creole, Italian, German, and everything else in the cities, but only American on the plains. They grow fruits in the West, grains in the middle, liberals in the East, data sets on the coasts, microbes in the labs, and hate everywhere. They claim to be Democrats, demagogues, demigods, Republicans, replicants, pedants, pedophiles, professors, professors, atheists galore, Jews, Christians, Muslims, Buddhists, Confucians, Zens, who can keep track, all confused, confounded, co-opted, conned. They devour what they produce by labor and lust, genius and greed, power and perversion, hubris and history. They slay their victims and all our victims, kids and killers, tots and tyrants, students and scholars, sinners and sinned against, marchers and misogynists, whores and holies, white, black, brown, yellow, mulatto, tan, browns, a palette of death. And the killers are given, a skate, an escape, an injection, the gas, a book contract, 
a white pointy hood with a militia t-shirt, an AK-47 with inscribed golden stock, and the killers are given to boast on the dark web. They sing of starred banners, spacious skies, Abraham and Jesus, death and destruction, race and riot, peace and prosperity, rhythm and rap, blues and bitterness, usually out of tune, often alone. They write tracks and tirades, poems and porn, screeds and sophistries, seething with wrath and resurrection, flowers and fears, love and hate, revenge and revelation, revival and retrenchment, today's tomorrow's and most often imagined yesterday's. They are shot or sick, shot and sick, vexed and vaxxed, deniers dying, homebound or hellbent, young and uncaring, old and cowering, black and suspicious, Democrats demanding, Republicans rebelling, plain passengers punching, sick and tired and tired of sickness, seeking to regain their normal, not knowing that in the history of this world, what is normal is today. They are this poet, this reader, this listener, in this moment in space, all sighing and saying it is for good or for ill, all knowing it is for a curse or a blessing, depending on where you have been placed by unseen hands. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Oh. Thank you very much for that. Next on the open mic is Tina Hacker. Hello, I have a thank you to Kyle because she steered me towards this and it was very, very enjoyable. Um, I'm going to read a poem from my new book called Golems. And in this book, there are 33 different golems and they're based on the Jewish folklore definition of a golem where a being rises from the earth to complete a task. And then after the task is done, the golem goes back into the earth. Some of them have names, some of them are just called golem. So here's one of them. Words while married. The task become a dictionary on demand. Dave remembers love at first sight. Sarah's not sure, but after 45 years of marriage, she lets Dave memories prevail. Their main love is each other. Main worry is Alzheimer's. When a word sticks on Sarah's tongue and won't come out, or a name slips under Dave's shoe and won't come off, there's fear. Sometimes they find words for each other. Together, they recall the sacred text to conjure a golem named Eli. They were shocked when he appeared. What was his purpose? Dave listed things he'd buy if he won the lottery. Sarah imagined hitting a hole in one or bowling 300. Dave rolled his eyes. His standards were higher. What a smart ass, Sarah remarked. Just like that actor in Ferris, Ferris Bueller's day off completed the golem. Joining the conversation, Dave added, Matthew, Matthew uh, Broderick, Eli provided. A mission was born. The golem helped the couple find words and names until the end of their days, then slipped away leaving some dust on their antique dictionary. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tina. Yeah. Last and certainly not least, uh, we have Mary. And please forgive <coughs> us if your last name. Is it Mary Enough? <coughs> Mary Enough? You'll need to unmute, please. We cannot hear you. Anybody in there? Okay. No, we can. Yes. And please tell me your last name. Knut. Knut. Thank you. Okay. 
Um, I've been reading a um, short um, poetry book, and I'm just going to read the first one. American Sonnets for My Past and Future Assassins. The Black poet would love to say his century began with Hughes or God forbid Wheatley, but actually it began with all the poetry weirdos and warriors, warriors, poetry whiners and winos falling from ship bows, sunset bridges and windows. In a second, I'll tell you how little writing rescues. My hunch is that Sylvia Plath was not especially fun company. A drama queen, thin-skinned and skittery. She thought her poems were ordinary. What do you call a visionary who does not recognize her vision? Orpheus was alone when he invented writing. His manic drawing became a kind of writing when he sent his beloved a sketch of an eye with an X struck through it. He meant, I am blind without you. She thought he meant, I never want to see you again. Is it possible he meant that too? <clears throat> Thank you so much for reading Terrence Hayes's, um, one of his sonnets from American Sonnet from My Past and Future Assassins. Thank you so much. And may we, again, we can unmute because we're gonna round out this event with a celebration of each other's words. <laughs> yeah, let's spread the joy. Thank you so much for our key, Denise Bergman, Kyle Potvin, Tammy Thomas, and all the open mic readers. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Okay, the gift of your words. Oh, yes, I feel so, again, spiritually, creatively replenished. Thank you so much for a wonderful afternoon of poetry. I also echo that as well. So enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Thank you. 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 Thank you.